So it's fantastic to see everybody here this morning. And this week, we're just in between series, so it's another wild card, which is quite a, a nerve-wracking thing for somebody to give me a wild card while preaching. But we're going to have some fun this morning. We're going to have some fun. And I was, uh, I was on a little bit of a gardening project. So we've done, we've done the Secret Garden series. And I, I sort of like gardening as long as it involves big machines. I'm not really one for planting flowers. Not really into all of that. Jaws, the, the, she goes all the flowers and buys the stuff and I have to put it in the right place. But where I'm interested in gardening is what's called landscaping. If there's a big pile of rubble that needs turning into a lawn and I need a digger and a dumper truck to do it, that's my sort of gardening. And I'm also okay with like building decks. I'm okay with patios. I like all of that sort of stuff until it gets to putting soil in and planting. That's when you lose my interest. So the other week, I was, uh, I was with a friend of mine, you might know him, Phil Denny, and we were, I was helping him build a deck in his garden. Now, Phil had taken the deck to bits, the old deck, and realized that he didn't know how to put the new ba deck back together. So as these things happen sometimes, is that actually he rang me up and said, well, just give, give us a hand and point me in the right direction. And to be fair to Phil, he did most of the work. But while we were doing it, we had a lovely time because I love, I relax by building things. I've got a little man shed that I go into on those quiet moments and I build things and I, I love making things and that's how I relax. And we were building this deck and to be fair, we didn't really talk to each other. We just had a lovely time. Phil put some tunes on in the morning and we had a little bit of R&B in the morning, a little bit of R&B, that was lovely. So we're getting into it slowly and then the sun came out. And we're halfway, I've done all the steps for the deck and it's looking lovely. And, and I asked for a cold glass of water. And by some miraculous miracle, a shandy came out. And, and I don't know how it happened. It was, like, it was like the wedding at Canaan. I asked for water and I got a shandy. And I'm drinking this ice cold shandy. I asked for a water but I got a shandy. On these steps that we've just built. And then Phil put some dance tunes on. 90s dance. And in a moment it felt... A little bit like heaven, right? <laughs> Drinking a shandy, building a deck, got me mates there. It's good and 90s dance game on. So we're just about finished around 8 o'clock at night and I was driving home and, and I thought, I'm going to keep this dance tune thing going. I'm going to keep it going. Windows down, dance tunes on. Bit of dancing like this, Isla. Yeah, that's how I dance, a bit of this. It's all good. And then this is what happened. Driving along, just turning down from Green Mount down to, uh, down to Ramsbottom. And this is the tune that came on. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Wind is down, turn it up. Here we go. Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Oh! Living the dream. It's that moment at every wedding where James Fernley gets up to the dance floor. That, that moment. And in that moment, as I was enjoying that track in the sunshine, windows down, turned up full blast, all of these people going, what is that 40-year-old man doing driving down there with that chain? Anyway, all of that embarrassment went by the window, and it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but in that moment, because this is how God speaks to me, he said, what is love? What is love? Because when it comes to gardening and landscaping, I like to do the big jobs. I like to do the things that gets everything ready, that, that gets the lawn ready to play, that builds all the decking and all the different things before we do the planting. And the Bible talks about the same sort of things. God puts the big things in first. So this morning, what is love? Now, Paul Hadaway, who wrote that song, What is Love? His understanding of love was on the fact that his baby shouldn't hurt him. Shouldn't hurt him. Shouldn't hurt him. No more. <laughs> and that's, that's what he was singing about. His understanding of love was about whether his baby was hurting him or not. Now, I'm presuming it was his girlfriend as opposed to the baby in the cot. So, we're going... We're going but, isn't it funny, isn't it funny that how we interpret love is often how we have 
experienced love or how others have experienced love with us. And actually, our interpretation of love, what is love, the answer to that question can often be dictated by circumstances, by the people in our world, by the things that have hurt us, if it's our baby or not. But what we need to understand is what the Bible, what God, what He says love is. Because love is such a massive part of the kingdom landscape. It's such a massive part of everything we do as Christians. It's such a massive part of every one of us that if we interpret love wrong, all the other things that come after that can often be interpreted wrong. My old boss used to say, put the big tent pegs in first. And that's what love is in the Bible. Get the big stakes in the ground first, and then everything's secure, and then you can go around the tent as leisurely as you want, putting the little pins in that hold everything out nice and put the windows up and all of that. And if you've never been camping, you're going, what is he on about? But the big tent peg, the big bit of landscaping that the Bible talks about is love. And if you've ever been to church, if this is your first time in church, if you've ever been to a christening, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, a funeral, you will know that the Bible talks a lot about love. And this morning, we're going to look at a passage in the Bible that is often used at weddings, but I think needs using every single day of our lives. So if you've got your Bibles with you, if you haven't, bring them. It's always helpful. It's not going to be on the screen this morning, so that'll teach you, those ones who didn't bring the Bible. But most of the important things will be. So let's read this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to set the scene a little bit because it's really important. So Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And what's happening in the church of Corinth is they've got all of these spiritual gifts. They're starting to build the church. They've got leaders. They've got all of these different people in all of these different places. But they're starting to get a little bit full of themselves. They're starting to put the importance on the gift. They're starting to put the importance on who is the most talented. They're starting to put the importance on who, who's got the most knowledge. They're starting to put their importance on all of the wrong things. And then Paul turns into Yoda. And this is how he starts his passage. He says, and yet I will show you a most excellent way. It's a terrible Yoda impression. Really apologize for that. But that's what it made me think of when he said it. But it says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And this is what he says to the church at Corinth. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all of my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. But what is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, when is in part disappears. When I was a child, I taught like a child. I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then we shall know fully, even as I am fully known. 
And now these three things remain. These are the big tent pegs. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And the Bible tells us what love is. And isn't it funny that that word, and this word is agape or agape, depending on how your Greek pronunciation is on a Sunday morning. And it's the unconditional love of God. It's that love that started this whole process of, of God sending Jesus to die on a cross for us. And this little word love that we often use and hear said about all the time in our world is described in such fine detail in this passage, it is absolutely brilliant. Because sometimes we narrow love down to this little thing. We narrow love down to our understanding of it. Whatever's happened to us, we put love in that bracket. And if we're not careful, you can make love a small thing. But the love that the Bible talks about, the what is love that the Bible talks about, is so vast. It weaves its way through every single part of every who we are. It is an unconditional love that God the creator of the heavens and the earth, has set in the landscape of his kingdom such an incredible love that we need a revelation in our heart of the vastness, the vastness of what that love is. So let's break it down. Because this is hard. It's all right saying what is love? It's all right talking about love. It's all right saying, I love you. It's all right looking at whether your baby's hurting you or not as your description of love. But actually, when God breaks this down, when Paul breaks this down and says, this is the love that we're talking about, then it gets really, really challenging really, really quick. But the good news is, the first challenge is for us to say, God, that's your love that you're talking about. It's impossible. It is impossible without God to love like this. We're talking about the unconditional love of God. So let's start and have a look at the things that love is. Love is patient. I have fallen at the first hurdle. The most impatient man in the history of mankind, ladies and gentlemen, Ian Scholes. Love is patient. What does it look like when love is patient? See, God's patient, patience is so incredible that he will love you even though we are an idiot for as long as it takes for us to stop being idiots. That's the Burnley version of the Bible. And he will love and he will correct and he will help and he will take you around the same place again, over and over again, because his love is so patient and so vast that whoever we are and wherever we are and whatever we do in his patience will exceed our being an idiot. God's love is perfectly patient. That's not just you can do whatever you want for as long as you want and that's fine because that's not how it works. If you want God's love, he will patiently walk you through the process of being more and more like him and being the person that you need to be in order to walk into the things he's created you to be. But that patience, that love in patience will take as long as it needs to take. Someone once asked me something because they thought they were on the wrong track in Christian life. And I said, who said there was a track? And sometimes in life, we look at other Christians and other people around us and go, we should be there because that's what we should be like. Now, it's a load of nonsense. God will do with you what God will do with you because he loves you so much. He's not worried about what somebody else is doing. The brilliance about God's love is he loves you so much as an individual, 
He will be as patient with you as he needs to be to help you in all the things he's got for you. How brilliant is that? Patience in love. It does not boast. It does not boast. Love does not boast. Now, sometimes, because we're human beings, we just like to tell other human beings how good we are. The general reason for that is to make us feel slightly better than them. Now, there's other things that might, you might come up against, but generally, when you boil it all down, it's because you want them to know how great you are. Love does not boast. It does not dishonor others. If we had a love that didn't dishonor others in our church and in our community, 99.9% .9 of the problems would go away like that. Wouldn't they? That all our thoughts are, I'm going to honor, I'm going to honor, I'm going to honor. It was brilliant to see Philip being honored. It's brilliant. It's brilliant to honor. It's brilliant to put other people first and say, you are brilliant at that. And it moves us to the back, which is sometimes where we feel a bit uncomfortable, but we're sitting in that love, so we're cool with that, aren't we? We know God loves us with all of this good love. So we're all right if somebody else looks better than we do, yeah? So from a place of love, we can honor other people and go, thanks, God. Me honoring them is as good showing your love and helping me to understand your love as me being honored myself. How wonderful is God's love? I'm going to rush through a few of these. But stick with me. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Boom. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. In this place, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to do something about truth this morning. And I believe that God is going to touch a few people's hearts, and I've said I'm happy for him to touch my heart as well, that if there is anything in our worlds that we feel like we are compromising on the truth, that God will touch us and we'll do something about it. Because with love comes homework. Because if you want to walk in all of these things, we have got to have those conversations that help us walk in them. And remember, love is patient, because it doesn't always happen overnight. But I believe God's going to drop some seeds of these things in our hearts just to help us understand and start acting like this love. It always trusts. It always perseveres. It's kind. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking. It keeps no record of wrongs. Wow. That's a toughie, isn't it? Jesus died on the cross for you and me because he loves us. In that moment, kept no records of wrongs. Put your hand up. If Jesus did that for you, you think you can keep records of other people's wrongs. No hands, good. That's the right answer. But it's hard, isn't it? It's easy to say it. It's easy to hear that at a wedding because it makes sense. But keeping records of other people's wrongs just so we can bring them up in the future or we can just hold something against them or actually it does more in our hearts than it does in anybody else's we're keeping the records of the wrongs for. But Jesus took all of our wrongs away on the cross and he kept no record of them. That is God's unconditional love. It opened a door for us to have a relationship with our heavenly father because there was nothing in the way. Not one thing. He didn't even remember one thing about our wrongs. No record of wrongs. I love this one. It always protects. Oh, if you're going through some stuff, God's love always protects. And we will go through some stuff. Life's life. The stuff that go, we go through. But God's unconditional love always protects. It always hopes. With God, there is always hope. And all of a sudden, this little word called love becomes this lifetime of understanding 
And all of these things that I've just spoken about in that, that word called love, when we say, what is love? And we ask God, what is love? He starts working in small ways. Small ways all of the time. I think someone's got some 90s dance tracks coming on there. All the time. To help us in every area of our lives. And we'll never, never, never just fully get it all nailed down. But the excitement of the journey is God has made a way through Jesus and his Holy Spirit, that we have that love in us. Oh, we have that love in us. The Bible talks about the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in us. The same love that made Jesus come and die for us lives in us. That love, that vast, unbelievable love, that is all based on the perfect, unchanging love of God. It's not about what my baby's hurting me or not. It's not about what the situation is at the moment. It's about the perfect love. God is love, helping us to understand what that looks like and how we bring that incredible love of heaven into earth. I love this bit. A lot of love this morning. A lot of love. Love never fails. Some people this morning, in the sound of my voice, need to know that God's love never fails. Wherever you sit, and however these words are landing in your world, God's love never, ever, ever fails fails. It never fails you. It never fails me. It's sometimes really hard to feel it. It's sometimes really hard to see it. But the Word of God tells me it never, ever fails. He loves you. 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 It never fails. You can walk out of this door with one thing in your mind that God's love will never fail. If that's all you think about for the rest of the week, Happy days. Let's keep going. Is this okay? Good. So we're going to watch something now. I had a bit more, but I think this is important. So we look at Jesus and we talk about love. And in this parable, and I was going to read it to you, but actually I've been watching a thing called The Chosen, which is about Jesus' life. And I thought we'd watch a bit of a video this morning. I think it's called a video these days still. Um, down with the kids over there. So we're going to watch this. Because I think when all of these things of love come together, when all of these attributes of God's love come together, we see and start to understand what Jesus did and why he did it. And in this parable, or in this story from the Bible, it's not a parable, it happened. I just love parables, I get fixated on them. But in this moment, Jesus encounters a person and every attribute of what we've just talked about in God's love gets showcased in this moment. And we're going to watch this together. And I want you to think about all the things that I've just talked about as we watch this. And you see this representation of Jesus in this moment. Go. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, would you ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? And a woman? I'm sorry. I 
should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? And why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come out new in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I, I'd still like a drink of water if, if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to throw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah, exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit, and the time is coming and is now here that it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me. I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? 
I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. As we just bring it to a close. There's a Samaritan woman and her experience of love was five different husbands. It wasn't going right. The world had rejected her. Just nothing looked right in her world. And Jesus, as a Jew, went out of his way to sit there in the heat of the day to meet that lady to show the world what this love looked like. That it wasn't conditional on her and her past and what was going on and what everybody else thought about her, but it was conditional on how brilliant God's love was. And he chose that Samaritan woman with all of the complications in her world to tell the people of this love of who he was, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was the one that was bringing a new love, a new understanding that was for everybody, all the hurt, all the broken, all the people that were doing well, all the people that felt they weren't doing well, whoever it was, he brought a love for everybody, which is totally and utterly unconditional. And as Christians in this place, 90% of anything that we do, if it's in the foundation of love, it will land in people's worlds and it will transform them. And it says in this passage that we were talking about earlier, if you speak in the tongues of men and angels but don't have love, it'll just be like a massive noise. It won't mean anything to anybody. But the reverse of that is, if we do speak with love, if we speak after showing people this love, then all of a sudden it becomes a sweet, sweet sound. It becomes praise. It becomes worship. It becomes healing. It becomes transformational words because the love is underpinning what we are talking about. It also says in that passage that if you've got all the knowledge in all of the world, but do not have love, you gain nothing. But with this foundation of love, from a place and a platform and a, a loving people, all of these things that we talked about, this vast love of God, if you put that in first and then you help people, that then you help people's thinking and you help with advice and you help with knowledge and understanding, then all of a sudden 90% of the hard work is done and then you gain everything because you're helping people to understand this incredible love of God and that transforms lives. If you give everything you have, generosity, if you give everything you have to the poor without love, if you, if you do everything you need to do, if you give all your riches away and because you're trying to do it in your own strength and look good to other people, it gains nothing. But if we give of our life and our time and our finances and our resources and the underpinning foundation of that is love, the truth is, it gains everything. We have an incredible opportunity in a world that has been through so much and have understood love from different places and have been disconnected and, and have found the last however long really, really difficult 
We have this incredible opportunity to underpin everything we do as a church with love. This unconditional love, which is not just a little word, but is a vast, vast word that means all of those things. But the, the challenge is we have to go on that journey ourselves. We have to say, God, that's your love. The only way I can, I can be a conduit to that love in the world that I live in, with the family that I'm part of, with the community that I'm part of, is that your power of your Holy Spirit transforms me first. You don't have to work on everything all at once because love is patient. But the challenge as Christians this morning is to say, God, where do you want me to start? Where do you want me to start so I can be a conduit? I can be a pipeline to this incredible love that if you and we show the world that love. It is transformational. And it's not us giving that love away. It's us introducing the source of that love to other people. Because he first loved us. We're going to finish with this. John 15, 9, 17, it says this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This is Jesus speaking. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandment, abide, and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That was Jesus talking to his disciples. And this morning, if you've never experienced that love, if the love that I'm talking to you about feels alien, if you've never started a relationship with Jesus, if you don't even know what that might even look like. There's going to be an opportunity for you to hang around afterwards. But in a couple of minutes, I'm just going to pray and I'm going to ask you to respond to this incredible love. And if you're not a Christian in this place, if you don't know what it looks like, but you're just thinking, actually, I, I want to know more. I want to start this conversation because I want to know about this love. I want to know about the God that is love. The God that describes this love. So in a minute, I'm just going to ask you, I'm going to give you a bit of time to prepare for it, just, just to put your hand up. If you want to respond to that, if you want to start that journey, if you want to think about that and what that looks like. And after the service, we're going to ask you to hang around and someone's going to pray for you. But I'm going to finish by praying for us all. I'm going to finish by saying... As God's people, if you're a Christian in this place, as his church, we need to commit to going on a journey with our creator to understand that love, to understand what that looks like in our world. So if you're not a Christian in this place just yet, if you're feeling you want to start that relationship, I'm going to ask everybody to shut their eyes and bow the heads. And if you want to start that journey this morning, I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up in the air, just so I know who's who, and that you want to start that, and we'll get someone to pray with you after the service. If that's you, put your hand up for me so I can see you. That would be good. And we've got a few stewards. You can put your hand down. Thank you over there. That's fantastic. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Fantastic. Put your hand down. Is there anyone else in this place? I'm going to ask us to stand as I just pray. And then we're going to go into worship. 
finish everything off. Let's pray for this love. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for every single person that's in this place and every single person that's watching online. I thank you for the vastness of your love. I thank you that it's a love that's unconditional. It's a love that's never ending. It's a love that is patient, is kind. It perseveres. It's a love that never fails. And I just pray for me and for every single person in this place that Holy Spirit, through your incredible power, that you will move in each one of us and help us understand more have a fresh understanding of what that love means in our lives. And as we start on that journey with you and as we grow that love in all its different facets and areas and understandings and incredible vastness, I pray that as that love grows in us, that it will just come out of us in every possible way to help people be introduced to the God of love to their heavenly Father who lavishes his love upon each and every one of us that they may know that they are children of God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on a cross to make a way that we can live in all of this wonderful richness of who you are, heavenly Father. We thank you for everything you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.